everybody. Welcome to ABA Inside Track, the podcast that's like reading in your car, but safer. I'm your host, Robert Perry Cruz, and I'm joined tonight by first my two fabulous co-hosts who, you know, snore, snore. We all know them. We've, we've seen them before, but I guess they might as well introduce themselves. I'm here as always. It's Diana. <laughs> and me too, Jackie. You going to finish that sentence or nope. just, just Jackie? Jackie. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> well, I have no last name, Rob. It's okay, just Jackie. Just Jack, like Jack Hay, remember? Jack Hay. Jacqui. Do you remember Jack Hay? Yes, I do. Oh, 221. It was always a good sitcom. But we're not a show about sitcoms. We are a podcast all about behavior analysis and behavior analytic research. And like I said, you know, hooray, we got our two normal co-hosts. That's always nice. But we're in for a treat because we are joined by a special fourth co-host tonight. It's Dr. Mary Barbera. Mary, how are you doing tonight? I'm doing great. Thanks for having me on. Oh, it was so exciting to have you on the show. I think you are definitely a name that if folks have looked into verbal behavior, there are a number of folks out there, a number of researchers out there, but your name is right up there at the top because you literally wrote one of the books about verbal behavior. <laughs> yes, I did. And it's actually published in 2007. So it's getting a little old, but it's still <laughs> as popular as ever. I know the iconic cover. I just see it whenever I hear either your name or verbal behavior. If you type that into Google, you usually get the image of, you know, the kid on the swing. So right. it's very familiar, I think, to anyone who's a practitioner. So it is a real great treat to have you on the show tonight to talk with us about a very specific topic in verbal behavior, which is the transfer of stimulus control, which I know you were mentioning at, at the top before we started recording, an area that you feel is not as well utilized, not, utilized I think was the word you used, right? Utilized by behavior analysts in their practice. Yeah, I do think it's missing piece of a lot of ABA programs, even with very seasoned behavior analyst. So I'm looking forward to talking more about that tonight. Excellent. Now, before we do, just in case we've got, you know, folks who maybe they just passed their exam, they, 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 they're not familiar with any of your work. Would you mind telling us a little bit about your background as a behavior analyst? Sure. So I often say I fell into the autism world <laughs> over two decades ago when my firstborn son, Lucas, started showing signs of autism and was subsequently diagnosed the day before he turned three. But he started showing signs of autism around 15 months, 18 months, but I was pregnant with my second son and not really noticing a very slow regression. Mm -hmm. So it was confusing. And my husband, who's a physician, first mentioned the possibility of autism when Lucas was 21 months of age. And like, I can still picture like where I was standing in my other house. And I was just like, what are you talking about? I was mm. horrified. And I had been a nurse, a registered nurse. I still maintain my license. And I had done a very brief nursing rotation at a residential placement for teens back in the mid 80s. Mm -hmm. So that's, that was my one and only experience with autism. And, and then watching Rain Man was yeah. my own. <laughs> I literally, I was just like, you have got to be kidding me. Like that thought never crossed my mind. I had a newborn and I had Lucas who was 21 months. And I, mm. I told him on that day that I never, ever wanted to hear the word autism out of his mouth again. Mm. And I went into a deep state of denial for 15 months. And in those 15 months, you know, Lucas, I mean, he, he always had a few words. Of course, I never knew how to teach him more words or mm. what to look for or anything. And, it was confusing, and then he went to typical preschool when he was two, and then by the time he was about two and a half, the preschool started, you know, well, maybe we should have a meeting because we don't we don't think he's ready to move to the three-year-old classroom next year, mm -hmm. and, you know, he's getting speech therapy, but the 15 sessions through private insurance was running out, mm -hmm. and and so then, and actually what got me out of denial was, was another mom telling me, I went to her because there's this thing called hyperlexia. I don't know if you've ever covered that, yeah. but it's interest in letters and reading. And Lucas was always really interested in letters, which, you know, I thought was so, oh, he's so smart, you know. And so I started looking into hyperlexia. And this was just when the Internet was happening and mm -hmm. searches. And so I started looking into hyperlexia. So I went over to a woman's house who was a hyperlexia autism mom. Mm -hmm. And I didn't have Lucas with me. And she's, 
she basically told me about ABA and about the LOBA study, and she basically said, if they are recovering kids with autism, you know, you should look into ABA because if your son is just speech delayed like you think he is, I mean, that would be great, right? And I literally bought Catherine Maurice's book on my way home from that visit, read it, and I was like, oh, my God, he has autism. And, oh, my God, I have been in denial, oh, right? Wow. And now there's there was a treatment I didn't know about. I just thought, why pin a you know a 21 month old with a diagnosis of a death sentence when maybe it'll just get better? Maybe he'll, he's just you know will grow out of it. And I didn't realize there was a lot I could do. So I had a lot of guilt then when he was diagnosed because then I of course asked the developmental pediatrician, but what about you know recovery? What about ABA? And he's like, oh, he definitely needs ABA. But in my long career, he at this point has moderate to severe autism, and I haven't seen that reversed. It could happen, but, you know, in, it, he didn't say it, but what I was thinking is if I would have brought him in at 21 months and gotten on it, you know, he wouldn't be so far behind. So definitely my fall, I you know, I say fell into the autism world because it literally felt like I had less, like fallen into a deep hole and had yes. to claw my way out. Mm. And, you know, as I clawed my way out... I was just like, at that point, I was a master's prepared nurse. I had been a nurse manager, always working in the neuro and rehab fields, always working with multidisciplinary teams and team goals and OTs and speech therapists and PTs. And so, like, ABA made sense. Of course, you know, as soon as we was diagnosed, I'm like, okay, we got to get ABA. And then I ended up not getting ABA, you know, recommended by the school system. So then I ended up in due process. Mm. And then I ended up, you know, in legal proceedings for over a year. You know, so, like, all of this happened, bang, bang, bang. You know, just like, are you kidding me? <laughs> like, <laughs> what is happening to my life, you know? But, you know, I had been a nurse manager, so, like, scheduling staff, being nice to staff, retention, all that stuff kind of came naturally to me. Mm. Even the legal proceedings and doing the therapy, my first consultant was from a low loss replication site. and She had a very strong early intervention background, so she encouraged me to get a babysitter for Spencer, my second son, and, you know, actually do ABA with Lucas once a week mm. for a three-hour session. And then, so I became kind of the lead therapist. Mm-hmm. And I'd have to send her all the data, and then she'd come for a full day, and then she'd go home. And then I, and my husband's like, "Wait, we just paid her a bunch of money. She came for a day, and now you have like twelve hours worth of work to do." <laughs> and by that point, then you know, six months in, twelve months in, I founded the Autism Society in my county, mm-hmm. and then my friend flew down to Florida to we we had sons the same age, pretty much the same ability. We were even sharing some therapists. She flew down to hear Vincent Carbone speak about verbal behavior and about the ables. Mm-hmm. So when she flew back, she's like, Mary, we got to change everything. Like, mm-hmm. do it, you know? And she just told me what he said. And, and at the same time, my low boss consultant was moving. And so it was a good time to kind of switch models. So I switched to a verbal behavior consultant through Rutgers. Mm-hmm. But at the time, I mean, we're talking 2000, you know, 20 years ago, I mean, Nobody knew what they were doing in terms of verbal behavior or ables or anything. Mm -hmm. So, you know, in a lot of ways, I was on the ground level and I was in a desperate situation to figure it out for Lucas. Mm -hmm. And then it was my first, actually my first attorney through due process. After I got off the stand at five hours of testimony, most people settle with due process, but no, not me. I, you know, we went all the way up to federal court filing. And when I got off the stand, he's like, after five hours of testimony, he's like, you should become a behavior analyst. I'm like, what? What's that? <laughs> and he said, this was probably 2001. He's like, oh, it's a new certification. They just started. You do a distance learning program through Penn State. And I wasn't in any position to be, you know, traveling for school or anything. Mm-hmm. So, you know, I, so I did the distance program through Penn State. And at the time, it was literally a box of VHS tapes and binders, wow. PowerPoints. And I'd have to go over to the hospital where I had a proctor for my exams. Like, it was not online. <laughs> so I'm thinking it sounds more like a correspondence course. It was. <laughs> than like what we think of online learning. <laughs> yeah, but it was great for me, you know, because of my nursing background, I had a lot of psychology courses, a lot of 
you know, my neuro background. It just made total sense to me. And even in the nursing field, I my master's from the University of Penn in, in nursing and nursing administration. So I had started research and presenting and publications in the nursing field on things like nursing retention, shift to shift report, time management, all OBM kind of topics. So I didn't know what ABA was, but in my mind, I always thought like a behavior analyst. Yeah, it was familiar, familiar at least in, in content, if not the specific language being used. Yeah. Yeah. And well, when you think about it, I mean, that's all behavior change is, is using the scientific method, assessing, planning, treating, evaluating. And so for me, it was kind of like treating a patient in the nursing field or coming up with a new system for shift to shift report. Mm-hmm. So it, it just really made sense. And I, I, found that I, I really loved it and I was good at it. And it was kind of frightening, like a year into helping with Lucas's program. I was like, I remember at one point thinking like, this is really frightening. Like I know more than 99% of the people in the world about autism mm. and like, it was scary, <laughs> you know, in a lot of ways it was like the wild west, especially in terms of verbal behavior. My next question for you, Mary, it seems like a lot of your, Coming into behavior analysis came very organically. It was something that was a necessity in a lot of ways. But how did you specifically become so uh, associated with verbal behavior versus, say, OBM? I, I know you've done some work on staff training since then, but so much of your work has been sort of tied in with, you know, the verbal behavior approach. Was it just the new training or the new BCBA from Rutgers, the verbal behavior approach just clicked with you? Was it you just found that format of teaching or discussing verbal behavior was just that much more interesting? What what exactly do you think it was? It was the fact that I needed procedures to teach Lucas Mm -hmm. because he was always kind of a stuck intermediate learner. So, you know, for instance, I spent years trying to teach him same different. I spent years trying to teach him yes, no tax. Like all of these things that if I didn't figure out how to teach him, nobody was going to be able to teach him. Mm-hmm. And early on, I also went to, I would go to any lectures. I mean, Lucas was a horrible sleeper. And so I would literally go to autism conferences so I could sleep in my own bed. <laughs> and I would go to any any camp. It didn't have to be ABA. Anybody that was talking about autism, if I could go, I would go. Because mm-hmm. I could get a good night's sleep, and then I would go, and I would listen, and I would see. Can I use those? Can I, you know, how can this apply to Lucas? And at that point, it was just Lucas. And really, it was out of necessity that I got to be an expert in verbal behavior because no one, even the consultant that I got compared to my OVAS consultant with an early intervention background, like he was not, you know, he was nowhere near the knowledge level that, you know, any of us are at this point, you know, for sure. But it was very rough in the beginning. And so it was like out of necessity, like I had to figure this out. I had to figure out how to do the ABLES, but then how to program for him. And then, you know, it was just weird stuff. I remember starting a, you know, Band-Aid tolerance program. Mm -hmm. All of a sudden, he stopped saying yes and no. Or, you know, it was just like, oh, my God, how how does this happen? But it's like I was ignoring the no's, and then I got yeses. I was like, oh, my God. (laughs) (laughs) And so, yeah, I think it was just I was motivated to figure it out for Lucas. And then once I figured it out for Lucas, it started taking my courses And then really the other big thing that happened was in 2003, I was just about finished with my distance learning program, ready to sit for my exam. And I think it was, it was the spring of 2003 and Lucas was ready to go to kindergarten. Mm -hmm. And, you know, he had now a 40 hour week program in my home for three years, right? Mm -hmm. So transitioning to kindergarten was not exciting for any of us. And I had heard about this grant in heart of Pennsylvania, you know, a couple hours from my home. And this was called the Verbal Behavior Project. Mm -hmm. And I became friends with the guy who was running it. And we founded like a statewide advocacy group. So I was, you know, I was a leader in my county and then a leader in the state for advocacy. So I'm like, okay, we have to figure out how to transition Lucas 
to kindergarten with like a verbal behavior ABA program. Mm -hmm. And then I got attached to this grant and then I got an email, hey, you're being considered for this position as a behavior analyst for the verbal behavior project. I'm like, well, I wasn't really looking for a job, (laughs) but I guess, you know, and so I applied and yeah, so that was like really my learning ground because that wasn't just Lucas who was an intermediate learner who was vocal and pretty compliant. That was hundreds of kids mm-hmm. at all different points on the spectrum, all different ages, and it was great. And so then I could apply a lot of what I had figured out for Lucas and to many, many kids and, and to also train multiple staff members. Yeah, so in a way, like as I tell the story, which I haven't told for a long time, so I hope I'm not too long-winded with it. But No, it's good to hear. It's good to hear. Yeah, but in a lot of ways, it was kind of like I was just at the right place at the right time. Mm -hmm. Verbal behavior does feel like one of the components of behavior analysis that, you know, the original discussion of the verbal operands and Skinner's verbal behavior is very, very old. But it almost feels like the forgotten chapter, you know, it's like the apocrypha of behavior analysis and everyone sort of pretended it didn't exist until around the time that that you were you were getting into it, you know, the the early and then the mid 2000s. And now it's I think it's coming much more into its own as an important component. We're seeing much more research about it, but it really did feel like I mean, I, I know when I was just sitting for my coursework. It was sort of like, here are the four operants. There's some other ones, too. You can read that chapter. It's a little confusing. And then we kind of moved on. It just wasn't really that big a deal, it seemed. Right, right. When I took the exam in 2003, it wasn't on there. And, you know, one of the things that was on there, which is now not on there, was decision teaching and the standard acceleration chart, Mm -hmm. which I learned about during one of those conferences in 2000 was attending a conference and a workshop by Rick Cabina. And yeah, so he became a very, very strong mentor of mine as well. Mm-hmm. Dr. Mark Sundberg was very involved in the early days of the Pennsylvania Verbal Behavior Project as well. We used to go up to the Carbone Clinic for two-day stretches for mm-hmm. training. We went. I probably was up there eight times. And so I got a lot of great training. We brought somebody in for direct instruction. And then we were able to go into these classrooms and just hit the ground running with all of these procedures. Now, when I left the project in 2010, and in the process, I wrote my book in 2007, it was published. Mm -hmm. And also, I earned a PhD. I was in PhD course from 2006 to 2011. So a lot was happening. And then in 2010, I left the Verbal Behavior Project which is still actually going strong. It's, it's, they changed the name right as I left. I don't know why. I mean, I don't know why it was just literally like it was the last year it was called the Verbal Behavior Project. I'm like, all right, I'm leaving. No. <laughs> um, now, they wanted to make it more, you know, I guess I got some feedback that it was too, like even with my book, a lot of people, I don't know, I guess I, I have this image of a lot of really seasoned behavior analysts saying, oh, yeah, that book's for parents or not very serious. Like, because the verbal behavior approach is should be titled Applied Behavior Analysis Using Skinner's Analysis of Verbal Behavior. You know, like... Yep. That's a hard sell. I don't know how many parents would want to buy a book yeah, titled that well, long. For <laughs> some professionals. But, you know, it's like the more you simplify things, then, I don't know, some people don't take you seriously. But anyway, I left the project finish on my PhD and I started working with the birth to three organization in my county through a contract with the real little guys. And then I developed my own system for teaching really young kids with and without autism, with signs of autism, because that's full circle, you know, bringing it back to that's really where you're going to make the most progress. And, you know, I know we're going to talk and we're going to dive pretty deeply quickly here into transfer procedures, Mm -hmm. but you know, when you're talking about transfer procedures and transferring stimulus control and intraverbals and and all of these technical S-delta and SDs, and, you know, obviously you can't teach any of that to a parent of a 21-month-old who is showing signs of autism. Mm-hmm. It, I mean, if you it, want to keep working with them, I suppose you probably would not want to want to start, right. to start and there. It, it's not... So now my procedures are really focused on how to get the most bang for a buck very quickly. I mean, I'm still serving the older population as well, 
But my real focus moving forward is to go back and, and kind of save the toddlers and the babies and, and change, literally change the trajectory of their lives. Yeah. I mean, I have people, I have, I basically run online courses now at full time. That's what I do. Mm-hmm. And I have people joining my course that are posting videos with their kids talking and, and they're like, two weeks ago, I bought the course and he wasn't talking. And it's like, I don't really care what we call it. Mm-hmm. <laughs> right. You know, and a lot of it is multiple control, which, you know, is really important. But I do think there shouldn't be this divide of we do traditional ABA and we use, you know, it really, like you said, it is merging. Yeah. But I just don't know how well people, you know, and I've seen this happen many times where I evaluate someone's program, whether that's on site I don't really do on-site evaluations anymore, but I did a ton of them in the past. But, you know, even just online where I'll take a second look at something and they'll have done a VB map, but then the goals are really traditional. Like Mm -hmm. they're not in line Mm -hmm. with the VB map. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I don't like that either because I really do think that the missing component in many of these cases is the use of transfer procedures the use of multiple control, Mm -hmm. and really the understanding of the verbal operants and the verbal behavior that's needed. Mm -hmm. That's very well said. I do feel like a lot of programs got very good at teaching tax and the very, very simple intraverbals. Maybe they did some echoics, but I'm still shocked that you talk to folks about how's the child man? How do they ask for what they want? And a lot of times like, well, we're trying to teach them yes and no. And I'm like, oh, how's that going? Well, they've learned yes. 100% 100% of the time. How about no? No, they never use no. They just say yes for everything. And I'm kind of not quite sure yeah. if there's like a disconnect as to sort of a, why would you have taught yes or no? What's the value of yes and no versus say just a direct requesting? Everything's got the politeness markers. It's very important that they have politeness markers. Like that's the most important facet of teaching. I'll see that a lot in programs myself. And, and, and it does point to, I think, a, a lack of full understanding of sort of how language develops, how language is maintained. And functions. Oh, functions, certainly. Right. And then you have, you know, we're talking about language, but you also have all the problem behaviors and the barriers, Mm -hmm. and then you have all Mm -hmm. the self-care, and then you have, like, really how the parent is doing in terms of dealing with it, coping. There's so many facets to what's going on. Mm -hmm. Well, I definitely want to talk more in general about verbal behavior. I hope we have time, but I know we promised everyone we're going to talk about transfer of stimulus control. So let's get into that. So for most of the episode, we'll be referring to your work on transfer of stimulus control as well as an extension. So I'm just going to, just for the audience, I'm going to let them know the titles of the articles the conversation will stem from, though we won't only focus on. And that's, of course, your article with Richard Kubina, Using Transfer Procedures to Teach Tax to a Child with Autism from the Analysis of Verbal Behavior 2005. And then we'll also be referring a little bit to, there was a follow-up, an extension to that study by Christopher Blau, And that is Assessing Transfer of Stimulus Control Procedures Across Learners with Autism, also an analysis of verbal behavior from 2008. So I guess to get everyone up to speed, make sure everyone fully understands what we'll be discussing, Mary, would you mind sort of giving the general description that you give to folks when you're talking about the process of transfer of stimulus control? Sure. So I actually think it's maybe telling the listeners this little quick story. So Lucas, when he was six or seven, transferred from the public school to an approved private autism ABA school. And when he got there, the only person that practiced any greetings with him was his teacher, and her name was Haley. This is in my book, Mm -hmm. in Chapter 7. So it was Haley. So then he had a therapist who would come to the home, and she would be at school with him. She would come to the home like maybe a day or two a week for two hours. And her name was Amber. And so when she would leave, she would say, bye, Lucas. And he would say, bye, Haley. Mm -hmm. And so at the time, I was studying to be a BCBA. I don't think I was a BCBA. Maybe I was BCA by that point. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I knew, because I knew Lucas's past, that we had taught him pretty easily the names of all 16 three-year-olds in his preschool typical class. Mm -hmm. So I knew that he could learn tax, and we also, through the use of video modeling, we taught him how to say hi and bye to people, Mm -hmm. 
having, like, this is before cell phones and all that, you know, we'd have a video recorder and we would have one of his therapists ring the doorbell. We'd open it and just say the the guy's name was Joe. And he'd Mm. say, hi, Lucas. And then we would pause the video and we'd say, say, hi, Joe. And he'd say, hi, Joe. Because before this, anybody would say, hi, Lucas. Lucas would say, hi, Lucas. Mm -hmm. So I already knew that Lucas had a component skill of learning tax and a component skill of learning greetings. Mm -hmm. And so the fact that he was erroring on Haley versus Amber was saying bye. I knew it was a taxing error. Mm -hmm. So I said to the school, hey, you know what? We're going on a two or three week break. Can you send home pictures of staff and students? I will, you know, teach him. Mm -hmm. And at that point, I didn't even know what I was actually doing. I was, I was drilling him because Mm -hmm. he was better on his ables better receptively than he was expressively or mm-hmm. tacting, I would just say, touch, you know, Joe, and he'd touch Joe. Who's this? And he'd say, Joe. Mm-hmm. So I was kind of like thrilling him. So I was so excited because after two or three weeks, he went back, and not only did he know everybody's name, he generalized it back to greetings, and we solved it. So I called up Rick Cabina, who was my BCBA mentor, and I said, you know what? We could publish this because everybody has, like, greetings and people's names and in their IEPs, we could publish something like this. And he's like, well, we can't publish that because we have no, like, what did you even do? And that I was really, I've had that same conversation (laughs) with, with Diane and I was like, I had this great idea and I did a thing and I think it works and it's time to publish. And it's like, well, there's some steps there. Yeah. You missed, you missed some steps. (laughs) Yeah. But you know, Rick being such a great mentor to me, he was just like, but no, we should seriously set it up. Mm-hmm. And we will, you know, figure out what you did. And I don't even think he was talking about transfer procedures or whatever. But so I really broke down what I did. And and it, we set up in the transfer procedure article in 2005, we set up three sets. We used multiple baseline designs. So it was so great because I had just finished my BCBA in 2003, mm-hmm. late 2003, mm-hmm. right? So you know, you learn about multiple baseline and alternating treatment and stuff. But unless you're actually doing it, do you really understand it? You know, true. (laughs) That is so true. That's why we require all of our students in our program to do a thesis and pick their design because they're like, I never realized. And I was like, yes, so true, Mary. (laughs) Yeah. So I think the fact that Rick was really able to help me set up a study from scratch that was meaningful to me. And we didn't use people's names. We used unknown pictures, you know, as tax. Mm-hmm. And we set it up as a multiple baseline design study with a five minute instructional session as the procedure. And then we also did the inter observer agreement. Mm-hmm. And the other thing we did, which was kind of cool, I'm not sure where I described that in the study, but the other thing we did was I made sure that the tax that we were teaching Lucas were um, known by typical peers. Yes. So we used I like that. brother, which Spencer was 18 months younger, mm. and we used my sister's two boys who were like Spencer's age okay. and exactly Lucas's age. So, so they were five, if, six, and seven. Yes. If they didn't know, if one out of the three of them didn't know the picture, it was ruled out. Mm-hmm. And I have really cute videos somewhere of me testing Spencer. <laughs> yeah, it was, it was fun. So we I got a baseline. The kids were <laughs> when I read that. Yeah, yeah. So we, we got three sets of unknown items. Like, I'm just looking at the study here of pudding, iron, mushroom, toaster, mm-hmm. ice cream, bulldozer, screwdriver, mitten, razor, toothpaste. The other thing I did was... Some of these things, like chalkboard, Lucas would say teacher, okay. or Sweet. like they were Class. embedded Class. wrong. Yeah. <laughs> yes. Lemon, I think he said lemonade. Mm-hmm. You know, so we also made sure they varied. So set one has an equal number of kind of embedded wrong text, mm-hmm. and then, you know, an equal amount of, I think we even did syllable length. Uh, equal amount. Like we really tried to make the sets equal. That's mm. really interesting that you included words that he had an established error history. Yeah. As well. Cause I feel like those would be even harder to teach. Yeah. Harder to fix. And we didn't really yeah. know. Yeah. Okay. So then what we did was, you know, if I were doing the study now and I've done 
actually a ton of work and studies, not anything published. I did do a presentation Mm -hmm. like the next year or the following year with an extension at the ABAI conference. But, Mm -hmm. you know, most of my work with transfer procedures besides this article are are not published. But if I had to do it now, like in table two with the transfer procedure, the receptive to echoic attack, like the echoic was just something that Lucas always did. Right. Yeah. That wasn't required. Mm -hmm. So I wouldn't say, I would just say we used a receptive to tact, echoic to tact combination. And Mm -hmm. the other really important thing that I do put here, but it, it was more important than was actually probably embedded here is, is the partial echoic prompt. Mm -hmm. So it was the mixed procedure. And that really worked for Lucas. And I can tell you about the other study I did with four kids after this, but let's go, let's keep going through this study. Okay. Yeah. So, so, so with set one, I'm looking at page 158. If you're following along, mm-hmm. you know, if, if you're driving, obviously you're not following along. <laughs> <laughs> you know, that would be for set one. And we, we got a baseline every day. We got a baseline on all 30 tacks. We also vary the order of when we presented the tax, when we, tested the tax, so mm-hmm. it wasn't always in the same order. We shuffled the cards. We shuffled the sets. <laughs> so we had, like, the baseline on set two first, and then three, and then one. But then the procedure was only started for set one. Mm-hmm. And then as that started to go up, we started with set two, and then we finally started with step three. And then, as you can see, with step two and step three, I actually got a lot better at the procedure. And you see, I was, like, making very stepwise progress. Yes. Yes. I was kind of, like, focusing, hyper-focusing on, like, three or four at a time, you know? Mm -hmm. like I think I did even a pre-probe and a post-probe. And so if you got them right on the pre-probe, I was, like, gunning for it. Mm -hmm. (laughs) So it was this five-minute session, timer was set, and I would just use the combination of the procedure. So there were 10, 10 items. So I would put down, I think, five at a time. And I would say something like touch pudding. And then Lucas would always say pudding. But, mm-hmm. you know, even if a child doesn't echo, touch pudding, touch is pudding, right? What's this called? Pudding. And then I might go to another item and I might say, this is an iron. Mm-hmm. And he'd say, iron. Good. What's this? Iron. And touch the mitten. Mm-hmm. Good. What's it called? Mitten. Mm-hmm. And this is called, and I'd go back to pudding and I might give a partial of color prompt. This is pu, and he'd say pudding. Good. What is it? Pudding. <laughs> One error I see a lot is when people do a partial echoic and don't do a transfer. Like if you give any kind of prompt, whether that be a partial echoic or receptive, you have to transfer it. Otherwise you leave it at the prompt level. Sure. And like it's get prompt dependent. Mm-hmm. And especially with partial echoics, a lot of, I remember training a teacher and she'd be like, this is, you know, and she'd, she'd make like uh, holding up a pen. She'd go, this is a, and she'd go, Pah. and then the kid would say pen. I'm like, you just gave him a big old prompt. Stop sure. that. Stop that. <laughs> and then she'd go, okay, okay. And then she'd do it again and she'd form her mouth and make it a puss out. And I'm like, no. stop it. <laughs> <laughs> but if you do it, you got to transfer it. Yeah, you right. know, and you can't do it during an assessment, yeah. which is what she was doing, right. you know. So anyway, so at the end of the study, he learned with the procedure. He didn't learn anything without the procedures. Mm-hmm. And these weren't, you know, in his program or any any. Thing, so Rick and I, and Rick, you know, bless his heart, he helped me set up the study. Helped me, you know, like he wasn't a part of actually the study. The inter-observer agreement, everything was set up, and Lucas's therapist would do that, and I was the only instructor. But you know, Rick did the uh, lit review part, and surprisingly, at the time, is that all the references are pretty much the studies are almost exclusively. Not not all all of them, but mostly they're animal studies mm-hmm. using transfer procedures. The Woolery book is the last reference here, Woolery, and I just interviewed Dr. Janet Twyman mm-hmm. for my podcast, and she was just talking about how she was trained with Woolery. I'm like, Woolery, my transfer <laughs> procedure guy. Cool. But that's a really good book, and that really helped me with the controlling prompt idea. Mm-hmm. So a controlling prompt is is you can make the child do it. So you mm-hmm. can't make a child talk, 
or vocally tact, but you can make them touch, you know, mm-hmm. I gently touch. I mean, obviously I'm not like looking at over prompting anybody if they're not compliant. Like yeah. that's, it's, you know, but, right. but like, best um, case bringing, manual guidance, but like of, feed, yeah. you know, Toilet say hi versus yeah. wave Uncle high. Yeah. Yes. The controlling prompt is wave. And so even if, but if you have a vocal child, you can't make them speak. So mm-hmm. up until the point of this article, too, not only were it, it was mostly pigeon studies and, and rat studies talking about transfer procedures, but also at this point, we had the teaching language book by Sunberg and Partington mm-hmm. as our main guide. And they were recommending only a, an echoic attack as their procedure. But I knew with Lucas, if I held up things like bulldozer and I said, this is a bulldozer, and he'd say, bulldozer, and I'd say, right, what is it, bulldozer, he wouldn't learn mm-hmm. he, because he had a better receptive language. His attention wasn't good. His attention was much better scanning. Mm-hmm. And, you know, when you're learning like a foreign language or something, mm-hmm. like if you have a multiple choice or you can't remember somebody's name, you're like, oh, shoot, I can't remember their name. Mm-hmm. Like if I had a multiple choice, I could get it. Yeah. <laughs> right. And that's what receptive is. It's basically a multiple choice. Mm-hmm. And so you can get – and then, you know, on and on, I mean, all the transfer procedures you can use and the multiple control that you can use, all part of my online programs and everything. What I do is, is then I do matching to tact. I do matching to receptive. Mm-hmm. I do sorting to tact. I do tact into verbals. And like, you have to know what you're transferring from mm-hmm. to what you're transferring to. Mm-hmm. You also have to really know by assessment. And that's why I love the VD map assessment. Mm-hmm. And everybody's like, oh, yeah, nah. No, I love it. (laughs) And I far prefer it, you know, anything else I've seen. Mm -hmm. And not to say it for these kids that are, you know, I mean, my son is 23 now, Lucas, Mm -hmm. and he's still within the BB map. Now, I haven't done the BB map assessment on him for over a decade, Mm -hmm. but he's still within that language ability. And for kids that are in that language ability, I don't think you can get away with not knowing what a tact interverbal transfer is with a receptive distractor check. Like, mm-hmm. I don't think you can teach them well. Mm-hmm. And so I think the analysis of the operants and the transfer procedures is the key thing that's missing in a lot of programs. Yeah. All right, everyone. I just got to pause our talk for just a quick moment to remind you that ABA Inside Track is ace approved. By listening to our episode, you are able to earn a learning credit. Just listen to the episode. Go to our website, abainsidetrack.com slash get hyphen C-E-U-S, and you can apply for a learning credit. You're going to need to know two code words that we sprinkled in the episode, though, so listen up. I'm going to give you the first one now. It is Hannah, H A. N N A H Hannah, like that movie about Hannah and her sisters. Remember that? That's an old movie. You probably don't remember that. I don't. Jackie's looking at me like she doesn't remember that. Oh well, Hannah. Okay. And then I know I said we get right back to the show, but would you mind if we just took one little break? Okay, good. We'll be right back. Do you want to be a BCBA? Sure, we all do. Now you can come to Regis College in Weston, Mass. to get your graduate degree. Choose from any one of these courses. Master's of Science in Applied Behavior Analysis. Master's of Science in Special Education. Dual degree in Special Ed and ABA. Or be eligible for your post-master's certificate. You can complete your degree and be ready to sit for the exam in two years. And our 2017 grads had a 100% pass rate on the BACB exam. Come enjoy practicum placement support, ethics mini handbooks, PhD level professors, small class sizes, and a service trip to Iceland. If interested, don't delay. Supplies are limited. Learn more at regiscollege.edu. Again, that's www.regiscollege.edu. RegisCollege.edu. One more time, www.regiscollege.edu. See you there.
And we are back talking with Dr. Mary Barbera about the transfer of stimulus control. So, Mary, would you say that a lot of the work you've done since in terms of expanding the transfer between the different operants stemmed from this research? Because I think it's described really nicely in the start of your article in terms of here's how transfers described. You hold up the picture, you use your echoic prompt, and then you do your you do your kind of like cue for the tact. And then that's it. But bam, that's that's the one size seems like the one size fits all transfer procedure that was available at the time, or at least was commonly published at the time. And like you're saying, that's not going to be the transfer procedure that's successful for all learners. Right, right. And I think, let me tell you about the subsequent study. Well, Mm -hmm. let me tell you, first, I emailed Michael, once this was ready, mm-hmm. almost ready, you know, for publication. I had, I had no idea about when deadlines were. I mean, this is still <laughs> early. This is 2005. There's probably, you know what I mean? It's mm-hmm. very sketchy back then. Mm-hmm. So I email him and he's like, where the, you know, where did you come from? Like, who are you? Like, <laughs> my mom in Pennsylvania, that's a new BCBA through a distance program doing a multiple baseline control study that's ready to be published. Like, Mm. what? (laughs) Like, this doesn't even make sense because he was just like, what did your father do for a living? (laughs) (laughs) He's just so fascinated. He was very nice, and he said, you know what? This is great. I want to publish this. Mm. He's like, but I have to send it out to a blind reviewer, and it's, like, almost ready to be published. Like, the thing is almost ready to go for print. And I don't know if they were doing every six months or every year then. So he goes, I'm going to send it out to a reviewer. So he sent it out to a reviewer, and then he emails me back. He's like, well, the reviewer thinks there's a lot of problems with it, but we're still going to publish. <laughs> oh, no. <laughs> and he goes, you know, he has a question about this or that. And, you know, like I didn't describe, like it was the procedure was done in my kitchen. Mm-hmm. Like I didn't describe like that or something. Mm-hmm. I'm like, okay, well, it was at the kitchen That's counter. So yeah. I yeah. put that and I'll put that in. You see those and in then, like few. <laughs> yeah, I'm just like, whatever. And, you know, it, it's not in the lab. I mean, this is, you know, my house. Mm-hmm. And then the other issue, which was the bigger issue for the reviewer, which was a good point, is that it was a combination of a receptive like detect combination. Mm-hmm. We don't know how many receptives I did versus partial occurrence versus a quick. Mm-hmm. And who's to say this isn't just a Mary Lucas kind of thing. Mm-hmm. And so Dr. Michael said, you know what, I'm going to publish this because I think it's really important research. And it is actually really important research. And so I thank him for, yeah. mm-hmm. you know, for doing that. But, but he said, within your limitations and future research, because, and so just look, looking at what I wrote, because the two transfer procedures were used simultaneously is not known whether the use of the receptive part of the procedure was an important factor in Lucas's acquisition of tax. Mm-hmm. One might speculate that the echoic to tax transfer procedure alone would have yielded similar tax acquisition results. Mm-hmm. However, we believe the receptive part of the procedure was important because it ensured successful responding in the context of tax instruction. Mm -hmm. And I knew based on the way Lucas learned Mm -hmm. that unless I put receptive in there, he was not paying attention enough to Mm -hmm. learn quickly. Mm -hmm. And then it basically says future research should be based taking apart the two transfer procedures and expanding it to different kids with different protocols, some with high receptive, low echoic, you know, that that kind of thing. Mm -hmm. Which leads me into the second study that I designed, and mm-hmm. then also the Blau research. But I don't know the Blau research off the top of my head, but I can tell you about that a little bit. But my study that I designed based on what Dr. Michael would say, because I, you know, I was thrilled that he was willing to to uh, publish it, mm-hmm. and um, and I really did want to make sure that this wasn't just a Mary Lucas thing. By that point, though, I was in the Verbal Behavior Project. I was doing this kind of research and these kind of procedures with m- multiple kids, mm-hmm. so I knew it was going to work. So what we did was we I designed, I think on my own, maybe with a little bit of help from Rick, an alternating treatment design study mm-hmm. with four kids, two home kids, one my son, Lucas, Mm -hmm. and one Amira Stapuglia from the Pennsylvania Verbal Behavior Project. She's a BCBA. She has a son, 
a couple, maybe a year or two younger than Lucas. She did it with her son. I did it with Lucas. And then we did it with two of my BB project kids mm. at school. So two with a teacher at school and then Amir's son and my son. And we did four kids and we separated out the, the sets. Set one was a collect attack. Set two was receptive attack only. Mm-hmm. And set three was the mixed procedure as outlined in this, in this 2005 study. With Lucas, he actually did not learn except for if it was a mixed procedure. Uh-huh. Like a coic attack, he wasn't paying attention and receptive <laughs> attack alone was too boring for him. Okay. <laughs> How do you mean too boring? Like he, like he just, he just wasn't responding. paying attention okay. because I wasn't like, I was just saying touch bulldozer. Mm-hmm. Right? Here. What is it? Bulldozer. Mm-hmm. I wasn't going, hey, and this is pu- pudding, and this is, you know, <laughs> okay. it just wasn't on his toes. It was just a little too um, too, too repetitive. Perhaps. Yeah, it, okay. was, it was, I mean, I this is, these are just my, my uh, analysis. Yeah. But, okay. but, by, <laughs> but by mixing the two, then you had two different topographies of responding that were required. Yeah, yeah. it was just more exciting for him. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Even now, he likes work with multiple test steps. Yeah. Mm-hmm. I think it gets too boring. Sure, it gets boring yeah. otherwise, right? Yeah. What's this? What's and this? then What's the this? other kids, they, so the two kids at school had lower receptive columns than Lucas and Amira's son. Mm-hmm. So they were not anywhere, like Lucas and Amira's son both had very high receptive columns on their ables compared to the tacting column. Mm-hmm. But these two boys had pretty low, both okay. low receptive and low tax. They learned better. They learned tied for first. They didn't learn with receptive tact only. Mm-hmm. But they learned equally well with the echoic detect only or with the mixed procedure. Okay. Mm-hmm. And then Amir's um, son was like tied for all three. So in all four kids, they all learned as well, if not better, with the mixed procedure. Okay. And then I presented those results at an ABAI conference. They were never published. And then in 2008, when Dr. Chris Blau's study was published, in the analysis of verbal behavior, I was at an ABAI conference and a couple of people came up to me and they're like, oh my God, this Blau guy published this study. And it's all about your study. Mm-hmm. Uh-huh. <laughs> and so I went up and looked at the, at the ABB. I think I brought, bought it at the, at the bookstore. Mm-hmm. But when I looked at it, I read the abstract and I'm like, oh my God, Chris Blau is from Kutztown University, which is in my county in, oh my gosh. in Pennsylvania. And I'm like, what? And here he looked at the discussion and the limitation. So if you are a student out there looking for a master's or a thesis or dissertation, like look at studies, look at their limitations yep. and future research. I mean, he built the whole, his whole research on this without ever meeting me. He didn't know I was in Pennsylvania. He knew nothing about my book in 2007, mm-hmm. but he said I could, you know, I could write Barbera and Cabina 2005 in my sleep. Like it was so. <laughs> It was so, like, ingrained in what he was doing. Right. So, actually, Chris and I ended up friends, and he came and, and observed me in the Verbal Behavior Project, and, and we're actually in touch now, and he he's beginning to talk about doing research on my online por- programs. Oh, that's so, neat. So, yeah, yeah, so we're, you know, we're still in touch. And now my work is really, like I said, my work is really not to get into the nitty gritty research. Like I have really no plans mm-hmm. of publishing anything in peer reviewed journals. Like mm-hmm. my publications now are, are weekly video blogs, podcasts, mm-hmm. my online courses, which provide continuing education credits to professionals, <laughs> behavior analysts, you know, when you're talking about trying to really get kids talking and all that stuff, we really need to make things super easy mm-hmm. for people to implement, to see results. I'm a big proponent of stepping back, looking at the forest, not the trees, not mm-hmm. getting into tit for tat programming, because I think we really can fall apart. But yeah, my PhD dissertation was all about how to train. Mm-hmm people on the verbal operands. I developed a three-step procedure for training people on the verbal operands. Errol was teaching error correction procedures. Nice. And now it's, it's really like, I don't even want to train people on procedures. I just want to get kids like 
to do as well as they can very quickly. Oh, I know. But Mary, going back a little bit. So certainly, I think, you know, looking forward, you're right, looking at the forest instead of just the trees. But I do feel kind of looking at your, the transfer procedure you put together, which, like you said, just really came from, you know, knowing your son and knowing what yep. style of, you know, training related to these tax and to receptive procedures he seemed to like and knowing his ABLE score and then looking at your follow-up. But then even looking at Dr. Blau's research, he had very different results, I think, than your follow-up in terms of he didn't really notice a huge difference between just an echoic detect and then the receptive echoic detect procedure. But there was one learner that perhaps it was a little different. And I think it was that same pattern of perhaps it was that receptive learning. And I do think there's always room and I'm a little sad that you're, you're not still looking at some of the research on this because I'd love to see, you know, the results you would get <laughs> in how do we take some of our procedures and break them down a little more in that regard of what kinds of learners are going to usually benefit from a procedure like this in terms of that that transfer of stimulus control? What types of learners might benefit from the opposite procedure? Because, mm -hmm. you know, the, the name in the game is always individualization. And while that doesn't mean we need to, you know, recreate all the research related to, uh, you know, transfer of stimulus control for every client we work with, I think it's nice to have two or three kind of starter options based on typically you'll see this pattern with students who have, say, better receptive scores. And we don't really know if that's always the case. I mean, certainly there's some, you know, your research points to that potentially being the case, but there haven't been that many follow-ups outside of your work and then Chris Blau's work on even just that one procedure. And that, that just feels like another article waiting to happen, just sort of getting into the nitty gritty in the research world to just sort of save the practitioners a lot more time. I don't know. That's just to kind verify. of... Yeah. And I'm, I'm not opposed to helping helping with research or, or actually I'm a little bit with one of the uh, BCBAs who took my online courses and she is pursuing her, her PhD in ABA. And like I just had a meeting with her and she's probably going to be extending the study. And, you know, like... I'm still all about it. It's just that there's only so much time in a day. Oh, no. And, <laughs> yeah, yeah, for me. You. And it's hard to publish reviewed study. I yes. mean, publishing peer reviewed research with intro observer agreement and, you know, like I kind of got lucky mm -hmm. to publish this because, <laughs> well, first of all, I had Dr. Cabina who was an expert at research and an expert at publishing. And then I had Dr. Jack Michael, who pretty much was like, oh, gosh, this is interesting. You know, <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> let's just throw a bone to this, you know, mom. <laughs> you know, but it is really important research. I mean, and I've been places where people are like, yeah, the verbal behavior approach. And they're like, that transfer procedure article. I'm like, wow. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I think the publishing of is tough. And I think if you're not in an academic environment where publishing is required or endorsed or encouraged or, you know, we have a lot of things to do to help as quickly as possible. Mm -hmm. And I feel like because I've been in the autism world for over two decades, because of my huge experience with hundreds of thousands of kids, of my online experience and everything, like I really have a very mission to easy procedures out. Mm -hmm. And I, I am thrilled to be talking about this because I really do think that not enough people know about this study, and I think it's a huge area for opportunity. Mm -hmm. Oh, I definitely agree. And actually, I think that might be a good time to segue into uh, the last part of our show, our dissemination station, where, oh, we got a sound effect. <laughs> Could you hear our sound effect, Mary? It's, it's very fancy. We've got a... <laughs> <laughs> Fancy uh, mix machine here does all our effects. No. <laughs> so when it comes to transfer of stimulus control, you know, we certainly talked about this procedure in terms of that transfer control to the tact. And I know you mentioned that a lot of your work nowadays and a lot of the coursework that you have online on, at your website goes into the other kinds of stimulus control transfer procedures. Do you mind speaking a little bit about that work? Sure. So... When you know the operants, man's tax, intraverbal, the cupex, and then you know imitation, matching, receptive, know all of this information and errorless teaching and error correction procedures and, and you know all of this fluently, 
then it becomes a lot easier to really figure out that a lot of times in the beginning, it's not about transferring and getting one operant going at a time. It's actually useful control to get a lot of good responding in, especially when kids aren't vocal in the beginning. Mm-hmm. So a lot of my procedures in the beginning, like my shoebox procedure, for instance, yeah. you get a shoebox, you cut a slit into it, and then you get pictures of important people in the kid's life, mm-hmm. you know, the, the dog named Spot, the, mm-hmm. the fruit snacks, the juice, whatever they like. And you get pictures of that. And I usually get two pictures at the same time, identical pictures, so we can use it for matching coming up. Mm-hmm. But then you you hold up one picture at a time and you're saying, Mommy, Mommy. And the child, all he has to do is take the picture and put it in the box. Mm-hmm. But if they if he says it's part act, because you can see the picture, mm-hmm. it's part echo, because I'm saying it, and, and because he wants the picture to put it in the box. Mm-hmm. And um, it might be part listener responding because he might need, you know, in the box. I mean, usually kids like to put things in, cause and effect. <laughs> yep. I'm also a big proponent of table time and for toddlers. Mm-hmm. And that even goes against a lot of what people are teaching in the verbal behavior world. You know, they're like kids need natural environment teaching mm-hmm. and but what I find is that you have to really, really good natural environment teaching. Mm-hmm. And you have to be creative and you have to have a really sanitized room. And so I have actually done a lot of work in the past 10 years mm-hmm. <laughs> with really pairing up a table, not calling it work, <laughs> pairing it up that the child is sitting and attending, and then you have a nice flat space to do matching and transfer. So it's basically net and intensive teaching all rolled into one at the table. Mm -hmm. So while people could say, well, you know, puzzles or it's not, we're not doing puzzles. It's all that holding pig and I'm saying pig, you know, I'm holding it up to my mouth, to my face. So we're encouraging eye contact, we're encouraging, you know, at least looking up at my face, we're encouraging, tacting, manting, echoics, Mm -hmm. and we're getting words, and we're getting a lot of responding. Mm -hmm. And this is just resulting in reduced barriers, reduced problem behaviors, increased instructional control, and really, really good things. Mm -hmm. I have procedures to teach pointing, I have, have, so I have top of course, that's one of the options. That's for parents or early intervention professionals or behavior analysts that are working with kids one to four. And then I have the Verbal Behavior Bundle online course and community, which is it's like a huge, huge library of early learner programs, intermediate learner programs. I think it gets particularly challenging people who don't have these kind of verbal behavior skills to teach kids that are intermediate learners. Kids need to learn preposition, pronouns, interverbal webbing, academic correct Mm -hmm. instruction. Like, as far as I'm concerned, self-care and problem behavior reduction, things are just so important. And I remember doing a little case study with interobserver agreement and everything, Mm -hmm. pairing like a public interverbal versus tact interverbals. And it was part of the verbal project. And I remember looking at like set questions that could be used for interverbal responding. Mm-hmm. Like, why do you wear a tie? Or, or where are prisoners kept? Mm-hmm. And it's like, gosh, language is so hard. Where no. is, where are prisoners kept? You know? Oh, once we like, start getting to like level three, like let's find a thousand listener response by feature function. I'm like, right. uh, I can think of 32. <laughs> uh. <laughs> That's level three. If you're not completely solid mm. with your verbal operants, transfer of stimulus control, like, and then how to deal with stimming and scripting and problem behaviors and let alone aggression or anything like that, it can get really, really, really challenging. And, mm-hmm. and then, and the other thing that I'm pretty big on is medical issues. Because of my nursing background and Lucas, 
was relatively mild mannered, you know, without self injurious or aggression mm -hmm. early on. And then he did develop headaches and and chronic mm -hmm. sinusitis mm -hmm. and a thing called pandas. I don't know if you've ever heard yeah. of that. Yes, yes. And then when he was eighteen he diagnosed with autonomic nervous system dysfunction, and oh. he's been actually on a cardiac med, a beta blocker, for five years, and that has largely gotten rid of aggression and self-injurious behavior <laughs> related to pain and startle. Mm -hmm. So it's just this constant, so much that behavior analysts really need to be considering yes. and programming for kids. So yeah. like, the transfer procedure articles and teachers and even teaching in general is just one part of what we need to be be learning about and worrying about. Yeah, I really stress that to my students. I'm like, you just don't know what that child's perception is of the world or what their experience is like, what their proprioceptive situation is, right? Like we can only make a good guess about it from the outside but we just don't know. And they may not have the language to be able to tell us what they're right. really experiencing. Mm. Well, right. Mary, it has been so excellent talking with you. I think, unfortunately, like most good topics, you know, when we're going into a very specific component of teaching verbal behavior, we're, you know, we're ending, we're like, oh, but there's, you know, so many more hours <laughs> to go. But I know we, <laughs> I know we can't keep you all night and ask you every question that pops up with this, but I'm glad we did at least get to do a bit of a dive into the idea of the transfer of the stimulus control piece. And certainly I know there's much more that can be learned in the research. And I know on your workshops and in your book, the verbal behavior approach, sorry, I'm thinking of the journal all of a sudden. So great to get the firsthand account. I know that is always fun to hear story. how so research you. comes. Thank you. Yeah, yeah. And I also, in oh, just a few months ago, actually, a few, yeah, a few months ago, I signed the contract to write a second book. And the that sequel? book, <laughs> no, it's actually going to be about how parents, it's mostly going to be for parents, but mm -hmm. how parents can help toddlers and preschoolers with or with signs of autism waiting in line for diagnoses. It's basically my toddler preschooler book mm -hmm. uh, oh, course in a book mm -hmm. because I really think that the more we can get to the very young kids who are just showing signs, they might just have speech delays or they might have early signs of ADHD or autism. The, the more quickly we can teach the parents how to be the child's best teacher and advocate for life, the better the, the families are going to do, the better the kids are going to do. So that's going to be a focus coming up. That's only going to be published April 2021. But Ooh, my book now, that. The Verbal Behavior Approach, <laughs> is 2007. Mm -hmm. It sold well over 50,000 copies, Oof, and it's available right. in 13 languages. Yeah, this book. book, and that was a little publisher, a uh, niche publisher. This is a major <laughs> publisher planning on huge amount of PR. So I really think that this book is going to be going to be great. In the meantime, I have, you know, two online courses in communities which behavior analysts are joining and they're, you know, like one of the students is, is going to do her dissertation on transfer procedures probably. And another one said, like, by taking my course, like she's forever changed as a BCBA <laughs> for earning all 32 credits for behavior analyst learning CEUs. It's no longer type two. I'm not sure yeah. if everybody's that. So I, I feel like I'm on the right path for dissemination. And, you know, I really do think that transfer procedures and multiple control are a big part of behavior analysis and a big part of ABA programs. And if you're sitting there thinking, I don't really know that much about it. It is really important that you learn more because it is, you know, it's really important that we help and we analyze not just problem behaviors, but we really analyze how we can better teach kids. Because if kids are learning, they're going to be happy if they're learning at the right level with the right levels of reinforcement. If they're having problem behaviors, something's going on and we're not in the best position to be teaching them. That's true. So learn more. Figuring out what's, what's not working. Yeah. Yep. Yeah. It's the analysis. And, it, and it's got to be the analysis. In the past, when I went in to do FBAs, it's like I came to a point where I'm like, I'm only doing an FBA if I can do a VV map and present a solid approach. Mm -hmm. Because it's two sides of the same coin. 
learning language skills on one side, problem behavior on mm-hmm. another. Mm-hmm. And if you are doing FBAs and you don't know what interverbals are, you know, maybe you know, you know a little bit. Mm-hmm. It's a big part of why kids are not doing well in inclusive settings or even special special ed settings. If they're talking but not doing well, mm-hmm. more analysis of the language. Mm. It's very true. So, Mary, if folks want to reach out and get in touch with you, where's the best place for them to do that? Yeah, so my website, marybarbera.com forward slash workshops. If, like, I'm on a lot of these boards, ABA Filter and all these groups and places, if you have a question about autism, I have probably have a free resource out there. Just <laughs> you Google, you tell your parents, tell the staff, tell your students, Mary, autism plus the topic. Mm-hmm. If you have a potty question, sleep, stimming, anything you want to put in there, put it in. If I haven't done a video blog on that or a podcast, chances are I have. If I haven't, email me through my website, marybarbera.com, and I will make you one. But there's a ton. I have, I produce a podcast and a video blog every single week and have been for years. So there's lots of information. So don't just tag me in a group. <laughs> I'm a little busy. And I don't know the answer. I mean, I don't know where the sleep blog is or the podcast. So I just Google Mary <laughs> Autism there Sleep. You go. And then <laughs> I find and I have free I have a free sleep guide, I have a free potty guide. You know, I have so much out there. So I hope that you, if you're listening, whether you're a professional, a behavior analyst, and you can also tell the parents and everybody you work with, just start searching my stuff. It's really good. It's really practical. Build with stories that mean something. And a lot of times you'll get step-by-step information. I know I still have some of your potty data sheets from a, a webinar from a while back in my big binders of all my old research and all my workshop notes and everything. So I... I yeah. <laughs> I yeah. certainly speak to and, that one being um, a great, a you great know what? lesson. Yeah, and there's because of my nursing background, like I have always been potty training people, you know, <laughs> right. and so it it really just came naturally to me. So there is a lot of stuff out there. So happy for anybody to download stuff. We want to send another very, very big thank you to Dr. Barbera for being on our show today. It was a lot of fun. She's certainly a name that we are very familiar with. So it was super exciting to have her on the show to talk about one of her areas of interest, I should say, verbal behavior and transfer of stimulus control. So thank you again very much, Dr. Barbera. Before we go, I want to make sure everyone who's listening and would like to apply for learning credits gets that second secret code word. It is Walters, W-A-L-T-E-R-S. Walters. And that brings us to the end of another fun-filled episode of ABA Inside Track. We want to thank all of you for listening to the show. If you liked it, please leave, well, even if you didn't like it, I guess, please leave us a review on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, Stitcher, or wherever you get your podcasts. Hey, why not subscribe to the show? And then we'll appear in your inbox for podcast player every single week. If you like, that'd be fine. A couple other ways to get in touch with us. You can do that through social media. We're on Facebook, Twitter, Pinterest, and Instagram as ABA Inside Track. You can find these episodes posted on YouTube with the YouTube subtitling feature. And of course, you can go to our website, ABA Inside Track track.com where we have our links to the articles that are discussed in every single episode as well as a list of all of our older episodes and of course you can feel free to email us at aba inside track at gmail.com big thanks again to our special guest dr mary barbera thanks also to kyle sturry for our interstitial music for dr jim carr for our intro and outro beautiful themes and to daniel thabit for his editing daniel from liquid studios podcast editing We'll be back next week with another full-length episode. But until then, keep responding. Bye. Bye. See you.